Um, yeah, so thank you very much for the um, invitation um, to talk to you all this um, Thursday evening. Um, I'm really um, excited to give this presentation and honestly to sort of like get some feedback um, on some of the results I'm going to share, because um, this is the first time I'm actually presenting this it's about Australia, but to the Australian community. Um, so I'm expecting and hoping that people are going to have some insights that perhaps I haven't thought of. Um, so the picture I've got here is a picture that I took um, last year in the Simpson Desert. Um, we were lucky enough to be able to go out and do some field work. Um, I've currently got some seismometers out there running um, at the moment. And really, I, I put this up as a sort of, um, you know, picture to sort of represent the Australian red center. It's vast, it's flat, it's, um, mostly covered in um, sediment. But beneath um, that veneer lies a rich um, and vast tectonic history, which is what we see in a sort of a map of the geological provinces of Australia. But what I'm gonna talk about today is really the question of, okay, this is the surface expression of our um, geology, the major geological provinces. How deep does this actually extend um, into the earth, into the continent, that we could actually still be able to detect these different kind of geological provinces. So in the basic um, geological history, tectonic history of Australia, um, the western two thirds of the continent um, is the oldest part. And we have the Pilbara and Yilgarn um, cratons and the Gawler cratons um, originating from the Archean. And then we have the Proterozoic belts in Central Australia and the, the Northern Australian Craton. And this Proto-Australia was um, largely assembled by um, 1.3, 1.1 billion years ago. And assembled by these different, we think these different Cratonic and crustal fragments that were fused together to form Proto-Australia. And then of course, along the Eastern margin, um, we had much later accretion during the Phanerozoic to make the continent that we see today. So we have this geological makeup to sort of form today's um, continent. But since about 90 million years ago, um, since the breakup of Eastern Gondwana, when Australia separated from Antarctica and has since then been moving rapidly um, northwards, north, northeast, and is today colliding with Northeast Asia. And we think that rapid motion of Australia is exerting significant shear on the underlying um, mantle. This rich tectonic history controls um, many things. Somewhat perhaps obviously it controls the distribution of mineral resources, which is important for the Australian economy. And perhaps more topical, it also exerts a first order control on the distribution of interplate seismicity within Australia, um, including the southeast um, seismic zone where Melbourne and southeast Australia experienced um, the magnitude 5.9 earthquake um, last week. This geological history is well expressed within the geophysical characterization of the crust, so different methods to look at the different crustal components of Australia. So these are just some images from a compilation um, in a book by Brian Kennett, The Australian Continent and Geophysical Synthesis. On the top left here, we have um, the Bouguet gravity anomaly. And we know that in central Australia, we have these really strong, prominent east-west trending gravity anomalies. Um, that represent offsets in the moho of um, 10 kilometers or more. Um, we also have a very prominent anomaly along the Darling Fault in Western Australia. We see that geological history expressed in that gravity. We also see it in the magnetization of the crustal rocks. We see it in the radiometrics, in the um, composition of the potassium, uranium, and thorium. And then on the right is the moho, the boundary between the crust and the mantle that's been measured by different um, passive or active um, seismic um, methods. And we see the different geological regions of Australia have um, a deeper or thinner, a deeper or shallower um, moho. 
But when we move deeper to look at the lithosphere, um, you know, we might expect Australia has been built by these different building blocks, these fusing together of these different crustal fragments. We'd expect that we're fusing together not just the crust, but also the lithosphere, um, which would be attached to that attached to that crust, fusing together different portions of the lithosphere. But for the large part, we don't see, or we're unable to see, um, given typical um, ability or ability to resolve beneath the moho um, into the mantle, um, such um, variations or heterogeneity within the lithosphere. So here I'm just showing some images um, of the Australian lithosphere from the Australian Seismological Reference Model, or OSREM um, for short. We're looking at different depth slices of seismic tomography, and we're looking at the wave speed of the vertically polarized um, shear waves. So for those who are not um, perhaps used to looking at seismic tomography, the green colors here represent um, faster velocities. And we see that we see these sort of green colors in the sort of um, center, central and western um, portion of Australia. And that's representing where we have the lithosphere. We're seeing the faster velocities in the lithosphere, and we're seeing the warmer colors, the slower velocities representing the asthenosphere. Beneath Eastern Australia, we're already into the asthenosphere at 100 kilometers depth. We actually think that the lithosphere is very thin along Eastern Australia, perhaps only about 70 to 75 kilometers thick. As you go deeper, 150, 200 kilometers, we still have deep lithosphere, probably down to about 250, maybe even 300 in seismic tomography images um, in terms of the depths of the lithosphere in Central and Western Australia. And while we can, um, such models can resolve perhaps um, regions of Australia beneath the, the cratons, the Northern and Western, um, that might potentially be a bit um, faster or a bit deeper than other regions. We couldn't, it would be very difficult to look at this map and try to trace the geological boundaries like what would have been possible when looking at crustal um, inferences of the geophysical characterization of the crust. So the one thing that I'm interested, one thing that I'm really interested in, which I think it, can actually tell us something about the heterogeneity of the lithosphere is to look at the seismic anisotropy. So the mantle, uh, the upper mantle is mostly composed of olivine, this green mineral. I actually have a little sample from my mineral co collection here of olivine, you can see the bright green color. And these olivine crystals, the crystals themselves are anisotropic. So what that word means, anisotropic, means a directional dependence of any kind of property. The seismic anisotropy means a directional dependence of the seismic wave speed. So for example, on the right here, we have a single olivine crystal. And when seismic waves travel along the A-axis, they travel at a faster velocity, 9.89 kilometers per second, than if they travel along the slow axis, this is the C, will be 8.43, and at a medium along the beam. So in different directions, the seismic waves travel at different um, velocities. And the reason why this is useful is because it turns out when you deform the upper mantle and deform olivine, so whether that's through um, flow in the upper mantle um, today or in the past, or deformation of the, the continent back in the past, the continental mantle lithosphere, when you deform the mantle, the fast axis of olivine tends to align in the direction of flow or the direction of shear. So all these little olivine crystals, all the individual crystals within um, the upper mantle, the fast direction aligns with the direction of flow. And then you can sense that using seismic waves, which direction is fastest to then infer a direction of flow or the geometry of deformation. So this is quite um, useful. It's been, this um, concept has been used widely um, around the world to study patterns of upper mantle um, flow. So in the asthenosphere, 
the fast direction, which would be represented by this black bar here, that we would recover um, seismically, we would expect that to be aligned with the present day mantle flow field. However, in the lithosphere, um, if we're able to determine the fast direction within the lithosphere, we expect that this will represent the last major deformational event. So this has to be some kind of a pretty major deformational event in order to um, orientate the anisotropy within the lithosphere. So either that's from the formation of the lithosphere or um, deformation that would occur at plate boundaries or an orogeny mountain building event, something where you're deforming um, the, the, lithos the lithosphere is undergoing deformation. It then becomes frozen in. So we call that um, uh, fossil or frozen in anisotropy. And LPO here stands for the lattice preferred orientation, which is another terminology that often gets used. So it's, in the lithosphere, it's kind of a bit like when um, new sea floor forms at a mid-ocean ridge and you freeze in the magnetic field when that um, crust forms, basaltic crust forms. In this case, the, the last major deformational event freezes in the anisotropy and the pattern of deformation into the lithosphere. Okay, so what do we know about anisotropy beneath the Australian continent um, so far? Well, most of our observations come from um, surface waves, studies of surface wave and surface wave tomography. And on the right here is one such model looking at azimuthal anisotropy um, beneath Australia. And azimuthal anisotropy means what is, how strong is the anisotropy in the horizontal plane and what direction is the fast direction in the horizontal plane. So what we're seeing here at a hundred kilometers depth we're seeing sort of a rotation within the lithosphere. People think that they're seeing fossil anisotropy within um, the continental lithosphere at 100 kilometers depth. But as you move deeper down to 200 kilometers and below, the fast direction, which is represented by the, the orientation of these little black bars, they're all mostly aligned sort of roughly um, north-south. And that's aligned with um, roughly aligned with the present day um, plate motion. So the going theory is that, um, you know, as would be expected, Australia is the fastest moving continent um, on Earth today. And that fast plate motion is exerting a shear on the asthenosphere um, below, aligning all the little olivine crystals and generating fast, um, fast direction of anisotropy aligned with the plate motion. So here in, in this diagram, it's indicating um, a wide range of different models and see this strong anisotropy at the base of the Australian continent, um, at the base of the lithosphere and the upper part of the asthenosphere. You would, however, in the, in, at 100 kilometers depth, again, you would be hard pressed to take this image and see any um, sharp, variations in the anisotropy, um, like you could in the crust to be able to draw the different geological boundaries. One other way to detect seismic anisotropy, um, probably one of the most popular and most direct methods is to use something called shear wave splitting. So this is typically using um, body waves. You have an incoming um, shear wave with a certain polarization. And when it enters a region of anisotropy, like the upper mantle, it becomes polarized into two components, um, the fast direction and the slow direction. So this is a bit like optical birefringence um, in crystals, if you're more familiar with that. So what we can do is then at a seismic station over here, we can measure the orientation of the fast um, component in blue, and we can measure the delay time between the fast and the slow components, um, which gives us an idea of the strength of anisotropy, but is also proportional to the path length through the anisotropy. If this initial shear wave um, just so happens to already be aligned 
with either the fast or slow um, plane of the NSHB, it will not undergo this process of shear wave splitting and it will stay as one, um, uh, one seismic phase. So measurements of this kind of shear wave splitting have led to um, what I've called the Australian shear wave splitting conundrum in that people would expect using this method that you would see this really strong shear of the Australian plate moving northwards and exerting that deformation, that drag on the asthenosphere. But really people haven't seen that um, at all. And this is an image from Heinz and Kennett um, 2006 paper, which was titled the apparently isotropic Australian upper mantle. So isotropic means iso equal in all directions, meaning a lack of seismic anisotropy. And really um, sort of the results um, sort of plotted up here. Um, there was a mix of splitting. A lot of it was quite weak and really there was they find it difficult to find preferred orientations and you really don't see a coherent fast directions aligned with the plate motion like we saw at 200 kilometers from the surface wave observations. So this has been hard to kind of reconcile. So we decided to take a bit of a closer look. And um, so the first part of the talk, I'm going to be sharing um, some results from a study beneath central Australia looking at shear wave splitting along the, the Bilby array. Before I talk about that, um, we've just submitted um, the revisions to this, so we're hoping it's gonna come out and be published soon. This work and this project was started um, by an honor student, Claire Flashman, who did her honors with me at ANU um, last year. And I think I saw in the chat that she's actually on the call, so she might be able to answer some of the questions as well, <laughs> um, if we have any. Um, so this Bilby array was um, out in the field from 2008 to 2011. It was an array of 25 seismic stations in a linear transect about a thousand kilometers long um, from north to south across the Australian continent. And it coincides in a few locations with some permanent stations as well, uh, which turned out to be quite useful. And it's an interesting array to use, um, one, because of this sort of transect through the continent, um, but it crosses several of the major geological provinces in central Australia, the central Proterozoic belt, uh, which has undergone significant um, deformation, um, both in the Peterman orogeny and the Alice Springs orogeny um, several hundred million years ago. And it crosses these sort of east-west aligned provinces where we have these really strong um, um, gravity anomalies um, representing offsets in the MOHO, these uplifted crustal blocks. And if we've had such significant deformation to the crust, we would also expect that the mantle, the lithospheric mantle would also have played some kind of a role in that deformation but so far it had been hard to detect that within traditional techniques to image um, the lithosphere. So what we did here was to look at shear wave splitting on SKS and PKS seismic phases. So I'll explain what this terminology means. So these are waves which travel from the earthquake through the upper mantle as either an S or a P wave. So that's the first letter here. Then they travel through the outer core as a P wave because the outer core is a liquid and seismologists, we denote that with the letter K. And then they exit the outer core and travel through the upper mantle beneath the seismic stations as a shear wave. And then they tell us about the anisotropy in the upper mantle beneath the seismic stations. So we think that the upper mantle is the main region of the earth where seismic anisotropy develops. We were able to make use of um, earthquakes then from a distance range of about 90 degrees away um, using these two different phases. Um, we have earthquakes from different directions, but as we'll see later, a lot of earthquakes come from South America. What this looks like um, on the seismograms, which here is splitting looks like. Um, so in the top here, I've got an example of a, a split. So where we 
C, shear wave splitting. And on the bottom, I've got an example of a null. And that's what we call something where there hasn't been any shear wave splitting. So this split at the top here, in this figure, we're looking at the radial and transverse components. So the radial is imagine this is my earthquake. This is my station. The radial component is the motion pointed back towards um, the earthquake source. And the transverse component is the horizontal motion then perpendicular um, to the back azimuth. What we see in shear wave splitting is we see the shear wave arrival on the radial component. We see a similar shape of the waveform on the transverse component, but you see that they're slightly offset from each other in time. This then generates elliptical particle motion, which when you correct for the shear wave splitting, then corrects to a linear motion that's then aligned with the black azimuth. For the example of the null, where there's no splitting detected, we still see the shear wave arrival on the radial component, but we see nothing or very little energy on the transverse component, and the particle motion is already linear and aligned with the black azimuth. So these types of measurements, this can occur when your initial polarization of your back azimuth is already aligned with the fast or slow geometry of anisotropy. So such measurements, such null measurements can often also be useful in helping you try to determine what is the geometry of anisotropy and the geometry of the deformation. So what did we find? So on the left here is the station averaged um, splits at each of the Bilby stations where we, we were able to get results. And how this is plotted, the orientation of the red bars represents the fast direction averaged, and the length of the bar represents the scale delay time according to one second shown here. What we see in these measurements is we see a really consistent sort of um, east-west general alignment throughout the central Proterozoic belt. And then about here, sort of northwards of the Arunta block, there's a rotation to something that's more kind of northwest, southeast. And this is also true in the Tennant Creek inlier and Davenport ranges that seem to kind of more generally correspond to the angle um, of that province. In the middle panel here, I'm showing all the individual measurements. There is a little bit of um, scatter to these. And then on the right, I'm showing the direction of the null um, measurements. And what we find, which is typical for temporary deployments um, and typical of other studies across Australia, is that we had a lot more nulls than we had splits. We had 84% nulls and 16% splits. So we might only have one or two splits at a given station and five nulls. But I think I know the reason why that is. So if we look at the availability of the events used for the um, shear wave splitting, as I said, we do have events from a range of locations, but the vast majority of them are actually coming from the South America subduction zone. And this is at a back azimuth of about 140 to 160 um, degrees. And that's indicated here by this peak in gray, the number of available events with back azimuth. And we see that this um, dominance at this back azimuth then creates a dominance of null results and split results also at that back azimuth. But we have many more nulls than we do have splits. If we take that back azimuth, 140 to 160, and then I'm plotting that as the gray band in this figure, where I'm plotting the fast direction versus um, the station latitude. So this would be north, this would be south, and these are the individual station averages. I take that back azimuth null band, and then I also plot 90 degrees from that to indicate the sort of fast, slow um, potential plane. And we see that most of the stations below 22 degrees south actually fall close to this gray band. So what I think is happening is that the back azimuth of most of the events just so happens to already be aligned with the fast, slow geometry of the anisotropy generating a large number of nulls. 
compared to splits. Um, on the bottom here, we also have the delay times. Um, and in general, the station averages vary from about 0.5 to 1.5 seconds, which is generally typical um, for continental shear and splitting. So the interesting thing here is we have this kind of consistency below 22 degrees south, which is about here. And then north of that, the fast directions become a bit more variable, but we see within the Tennant Creek Davenport uh, ranges that the, the orientations are kind of aligning here with the geology as well. So we'll look a bit more um, at this, looking at the station averages against different crustal properties and features. Here again, showing the Bouguet gravity um, pattern, and we see the east-west gravity anomalies are very consistent with the sort of east-west fast directions we're seeing. Another figure here from a um, paper from Wellman, 1976, um, where they sort of, um, digitized or linearized the gravity trends um, or tried to do that with the data back then. And we see that the fast directions um, in many regions agree with these um, sort of gravity trends. And again, with the um, mag uh, magnetic intensity and the properties we see there. So we're seeing a large degree, of, there's the cat, we're seeing a large degree of correspondence between um, the seismic anisotropy that we're picking up from the shear with splitting and crustal features as seen in the, the geophysics. If we compare our results um, to um, previous um, surface wave models, um, so this is um, all the circles here are representing um, a model of azimuthal anisotropy from surface waves beneath the same profile along Vilby. The size of the circle represents um, the strength of the anisotropy. So stronger anisotropy is a larger circle and weaker is smaller. The color of the circle represents the fast direction according to scales shown here on the right. And colors, these sort of brownish colors here would correspond to the direction of absolute bit motion. So that's about uh, 20, 30 degrees. And we see at the base of the lithosphere, so this grey band here is the lithosphere asthenosphere um, transition. The base of the lithosphere surface wave models suggest strong anisotropy that's aligned with the absolute plate motion. In the lithosphere, beneath the Bilby profile, um, we see a transition from sort of um, beige colours into brown, into purple, into blue. But if we compare using the same color scale, um, what we see from the shear wave splitting at the different Bilby stations. So these are represented by the triangles. And then the color is the fast direction that we saw from the shear wave splitting. We see a, a sort of consistent fast direction, consistent color of these kind of beige up until station BL12. And then we see a, a sharp change to blue and purple um, to the north of that. So whilst the surface wave have imaged this sort of smooth transition in the fast directions, we think that the um, as surface as tomography models generally do, they laterally smooth. We think that the splitting is actually able to detect um, that this is actually a sharper gradient or transition in the anisotropy. And the colors that we see from the shear wave splitting are very similar to the colors in the fast directions that we see at shallow depths that are around 50 kilometers depth in the surface waves. So this is all pointing that the splitting that we're seeing is actually reflecting the lithosphere, not the deeper asthenosphere. So putting this um, together, we said here, this is sort of the, the takeaway, sort of final interpretive figure. The shear wave splitting that we're picking up at Bilby seems to primarily reflect the lithosphere anisotropy. And there's arguments and modeling which suggest that where you have multiple layers of anisotropy, you would actually be more sensitive to the upper part, which is what we tend to see um, here in the continent. The splitting pattern shows a strong resemblance to the surface geology, and it seems to reflect anisotropy generated by ancient lithospheric 
deformation at least 300 million years ago or more. And it means that these past tectonic events um, must have substantially impacted both the crust and the lithosphere if we're seeing it in the anisotropy. Okay. So the second and final part of the talk, um, I'm going to talk about something that's not as sort of commonly talked about as shear wave splitting. I'm going to talk about something called quasi love waves. And these are scattered, uh, scattering of um, surface waves. And they tell us about boundaries or sharp lateral gradients in seismic anisotropy. So for example, um, in the figure here, um, on the left, we have one region of anisotropy with a fabric that's aligned like this. And on the right, we have another region of anisotropy with the fabric aligned like this. And we have a lateral gradient here indicated by the dashed black line. Then what happens if we have an earthquake, we have surface waves generated and we take the love wave um, in green here. So love waves travel um, with horizontally, um, horizontal motion in this sort of um, transverse back and forth. When that love wave encounters the gradient in seismic anisotropy, part of its energy will be converted into really wave motion. So this is then motion, this retrograde um, elliptic or ground roll, ground roll type motion. So part of the energy converts from love into this type of motion, into this type of motion due to a gradient in seismic anisotropy, but it still has the same waveform shape. It retains the same wave, waveform shape as the love wave. So we call it a quasi love wave, but it travels with the um, velocity and the properties of a really wave. So the work I'm gonna um, talk about has um, been accepted in communications, earth and environment, and it's due to actually come out early next week. So keep an eye out there if you're interested in, in this stuff. So how it works and what it looks like on the seismogram. So here in green, I'm showing the transverse component. So that is um, uh, perpendicular to the uh, source receiver um, profile. And we see um, the love wave, the um, G1 fundamental love wave being recorded on the transverse component. The really wave in blue is then well recorded on the vertical and also the radial um, component, but I'm just showing the vertical here. And we see the quasi love wave arrives before the really wave, but after the love wave sometime in that um, time window. And it has a similar shape to the fundamental love wave. So what we can do is we can measure the lag time or delay time between the fundamental love in green and the quasi love wave in blue. We can measure that time delay delta T. We know the epicentral distance between the source and receiver. We can measure the time arrival of the really and the love wave. And we can calculate using this equation delta x here, which is the distance between the receiver and the source of the scattering, the anisotropic gradient. So once we have this distance, we can then back project along the great circle path between the source and receiver to estimate the location of the scattering or the location of the anisotropic gradient. This type of um, technique and methodology has been applied in, in different parts of the world in different tectonic settings that has yet to be applied um, in the Australian plate, but it has been shown that it does work in regions of continental collision along the passive margin of the eastern US, which we might come back to later. Um, in regions of sea forest sweating, the Juan de Fuca Ridge, and uh, along the subduction zone along the Italian uh, peninsula. And in each of these studies, um, they were really designed taking particular source and receiver paths um, to try to target regions where they expected anisot anisotropic gradients to exist and to try to um, pick them up and Im image them. But I decided to take a slightly different approach um, to be 
kind of more widespread and use the Australia, the Nas Australian National Seismograph um, Network, the national network, and take earthquakes from all around the world and see where do I find quasi love wave scatterers? Where do I find anisotropic gradients? And let the data just tell me um, where these are mostly occurring. Um, so in the map here, all the paths in blue are ray paths on which I was able to detect a quasi love wave. And these happen to be on about 22% of all the ray paths in background in gray or some of the paths in which I wasn't able to detect, make a clear detection of a quasi love wave. So they're quite prolific and produce 275 new quasi love wave uh, observations of quasi love wave scatterers. It's produced one of the most widespread and geographically diverse um, data sets um, to date. And you see they're quite, uh, you know, there's quite a wide distribution of them here across the study region. The circle represents a location, an estimated location of scattering, and the size of the circle um, corresponds to the amplitude of the quasi-love wave that was detected. Now I should point out that the amplitude of a quasi-love wave depends not only on the strength of the anisotropic gradient, but also depends on the geometry of the ray path relative to the geometry of the anisotropy. So just because the circle is small doesn't mean that it's um, less important or a weaker gradient. Um, it could be just to do with the geometry of the sampling. But where you have a large circle, you can be pretty confident that that is um, a strong, um, the existence of a strong gradient in that location. So that seemed, you know, see, we're seeing these um, scatterers everywhere. But if you actually start to take a bit more of a closer look at these, there's actually some really interesting um, patterns. So highlighted here in Cyan, almost a third of the data points coincide with the continental margin. So that is the boundary between continental and oceanic crust. And I've outlined that here with the cyan line. And then any um, quasi-love wave um, scattering point that lies within 100 kilometers of this boundary, I then highlight in cyan. And 100 kilometers is roughly the kind of typical size of the error on the location of these scattering points. And what was really interesting to me is there's quite a few scatterers along the southern boundary of Australia. Um, there's a few along the eastern boundary and on the other side of the Tasman Sea as well, on the western side of um, Zealandia, there's quite a few substantial scatterers and they seem to kind of follow the curvature of that boundary almost. And even quite fascinating is that there's a whole heap of them right here on top of the um, Gilbert Seamount complex, which is a little microcontinent that was sort of separated during the rifting between Australia and Zealandia. And there's a bunch here as well, right on the East Tasman um, Plateau. Within the interior of the continent, then in yellow, yellow is um, the Australian geological provinces, 27% of the entire data set actually coincide with these major geological crustal provinces. There's quite a few of them in um, north, um, in the northern part of Australia. And I'll just go to the next slide to show that more clearly. Here within um, the continental interior, I've mapped out in the sort of pinky beige colors where we have the Archean and Proterozoic um, crustal components. And there's quite a few of these scatters kind of associated with the edges of these provinces. And on the boundaries between in the central Australia and the central Australian belt. And we don't really see sort of within the large cratons like the Yilgarn craton, there's not many scatters within the, the middle of these um, middle of these cratons. Um, we've also got the colors here. We've got the seafloor age, um, just to show a bit more clearly what's happening there. There's potentially some scatterers um, down here in the middle along the former spreading um, center as well. 
In white up here, I'll just point out there are some scatters associated with present day plate boundary along the New Hebrides um, trench. If we compare this to um, the pattern of the free air gravity, I'll just highlight that there's quite a few scatters on the edge of these really strong east-west um, gravity anomalies in central Australia. There's also some associated with the right on the Darling Fault where we have another really prominent and strong gravity anomaly in Western Australia. And I've highlighted some of the geological provinces like the Yilgarn and Pilbara cratons where there's not many scatters in the middle of the cratons, but there's a few that exist on the edges. So a question that came up um, in the sort of review process for this work was, okay, there's this pattern, but is it actually statistically significant? If you took the same study area and just covered it in rand the same number of random points, would you expect to see the same um, correlation? And the answer is that in both cases, there are more scattering points closer to these features than you would expect by random. So that's indicated um, in these figures, and I'll just talk through them. So on the left here, we're plotting a cumulative distribution function, or CDF for short, of um, all the scatters, their distance, so the minimum distance of each scatter to the ocean continent boundary. So that's this thick cyan line here. And you can also think of that in sort of map form um, on the right. Um, the dash gray line is the ocean continent boundary. And then the different colors represent different bands or zones of distance from that um, boundary. And you're looking at um, you know, are you within 200 kilometers, are you within 400 kilometers, 600 kilometers, um, et cetera. And then adding that up to form this um, cumulative distribution function. In gray is if you take the same number of points and just randomly locate them, and you do that a hundred times, that's all of these gray lines. If you take the mean, of all the gray lines, that's that thin black line. And one standard deviation either side is the dashed black line. So you can kind of think of that black curve as being what would be the expected pattern if everything was just located randomly. And we see that from the observations in the cyan that we have more scatters which are located closer to the boundary than we would expect by random. And you can do the appropriate statistical test, which in this case is the two sample Kolmogorov gorov smirnov test or KS test for short. And you get a p-value of 0.04 or 4%. And often the critical value is taken as 5%. You reject the null hypothesis that your observations are the same as a random distribution when you are below 5%. So it's close, but it is statistically significant. <laughs> Sorry, the cat is going crazy. Um, right, so that was for the ocean continent boundary. Um, <laughs> next up, we can do the same thing for the geological provinces. And here we find, um, we get an even better statistical result, in fact. Um, so we look at the distance of the scatters for those which are located inside the Australian continent, we look at the distance of the scatters um, from these boundaries, and yes, there are a lot of boundaries, but what you don't find is within regions, um, uh, sort of within the interior of the large provinces, you don't find scatters in the middle. And in fact, all of the scatters are located within 150 kilometers of a geological province versus if, it, if they were random, you would expect them to be up to 300 kilometers away. And you find that this yellow line is above all the random distributions and we get a um, p-value of 0.09% in terms of being different um, from random, the, the probability that this is different from random. So, Key points um, so far, we detected a widespread presence of lateral anisotropic gradients um, beneath and surrounding Australia that are capable of generating these quasi-love waves. 
The locations seem closely linked to past plate boundaries or suture zones. And it means that these boundaries must, must be both preserved both at depth and over time um, in order to still see them in the anisotropy. And the depth that we're sensing here, we're using 100 seconds, we're looking at 100 seconds in the surface waves, 0 0.01 hertz. And we know that the peak sensitivity of those waves would be around 100 to 200 kilometers depth. So we're definitely looking below, we're not looking at the crust, we're looking below the crust, we're definitely in the mantle, most likely into either the lithosphere or the asthenosphere, depending on where we are. So I'll just talk a bit about that. What is the origin of these gradients? Is it in the lithosphere or in the asthenosphere? So here on the bottom, we're looking at a cross section at 150 kilometers depth. So right in the middle, right in the sort of depth region that these quasi-love waves are sensitive to. The blue colors are faster seismic velocities and the um, warmer colors are slower seismic velocities. So where we have blue colors, we're in the lithosphere and where we have warmer colors, we're in the asthenosphere. So for all these scatters in um, central Australia and so the western part of Australia, we can quite confidently say that these are most likely representing um, boundaries in fossil anisotropy within the cratonic lithosphere. Where we have scatters sort of like on the edge, particularly along um, uh, southern Australia, maybe up in the northwest, we might be at this depth sort of right on the transition from lithosphere into the asthenosphere. So perhaps looking at the difference between fossil anisotropy and active flow in the asthenosphere today. But the tricky thing is all these um, scatters beneath the Tasman Sea. So along Eastern Australia and um, Western Zealandia, at these depths, we're in the asthenosphere. The lithosphere is much thinner. Um, you know, beneath Eastern Australia, we think it's 70, 75 kilometers thick. So these scatterers must be telling us about something that's happening in the asthenosphere. So trying to explain that is um, not so easy, but we think it, it must be indicating something about the mantle flow and the dynamics beneath um, these passive continental margins. So an idea um, kind of comes from um, when you're able to do, you know, the images I'm showing in the previous slide is a, a global um, seismic tomography model. But where, such as in Southeast Australia, where we've had dense seismic arrays and um, sort of former colleagues um, at ANU, um, Nick Rawlinson and, and co-authors, um, we're able to do much more detailed um, seismic tomography and create more detailed images of the lithosphere asthenosphere boundary. And you see quite a bit of topography on the lithosphere asthenosphere boundary. And that's then indicated um, this sort of gray area here in the top figure. Um, they've used then this um, seismically imaged lithosphere asthenosphere boundary to sort of input into a model this is our topography. And then uh, a colleague, Roger Davies, then calculated what is the mantle flow you would expect then for plate motion above that. And if we look at our sort of depth range, 100 to 200 kilometers, where the quasi love waves are mostly sensitive, then you see even where you have undulations in the LAV, which are shallower than that depth you can still induce um, modifications or diversions to the mantle flow below it in the region in which we're sensitive. And where you have steps in the lithosphere, you can also generate edge-driven um, convection or these convective cells at, um, uh, associated with these steps in lithospheric thickness. So we think there might be something um, to that, that perhaps, this transition from oceanic to continental lithosphere, perhaps there's some sort of fundamental difference in those properties, perhaps in the viscosity, um, that's then affecting the underlying um, mantle flow, but it would have to be very localized, the fact that this hasn't really been seen before, but we're detecting it in terms of the gradients in seismic anisotropy. 
We think we're seeing um, fossil anisotropy within the cratonic lithosphere um, that represents past deformation that's been preserved since the continent was assembled or last deformed. Perhaps at the edge, particularly the edge of Western Australia, maybe it's a difference between active flow and fossil, fossil anisotropy or either due to a step in the lithospheric thickness, um, you might have edge-driven convective cells which then affect the mantle flow pattern and affect the development of anisotropy. Okay, so to conclude in terms of the, the results, both the shear wave splitting and the quasi-love wave scattering suggest that the Australian lithosphere holds significant fossilized anisotropy or frozen in anisotropy. And it, the pattern seems to preserve this rich and ancient tectonic history and it reflects the pattern of the surface geology. So really what it's saying that is that perhaps the lithosphere is as heterogeneous as the crust itself. Perhaps beneath the continental margin, there's um, we've inferred a disruption to the upper mantle flow field that's tied to that continental margin um, that hasn't really been um, seen before. And maybe these quasi-love wave scattering um, uh, measurements could be used as a predictive tool um, to help constrain these major tectonic boundaries of depth, particularly those which are hidden underneath the sedimentary cover and those that have deep mantle connections that might hold potential for mineralization. So just to end, um, before I take questions, um, just as a bit of advertisement, um, I haven't present presented any of the results, but we currently have um, currently operating a seismic deployment around um, Lake Eyre um, in central Australia, including stations in the, the Simpson Desert. And in collaboration with JP O'Donnell at Geological um, Survey of South Australia, they also at the same time have a seismic array out um, just below, just south of this region, um, over the eastern part of the Gawler Craton. So we're hoping over the next few years to get some more detailed measurements um, looking at these sort of questions around um, you know, the margins of the cratons and the deformation that's happening and being focused there. Okay, so I'll leave it there and I'd be happy to take any questions.